As we continue to think about plant-animal interactions in this integrated rangeland class here at the University of Idaho, we're going to focus today on forage value of range plants. So I'm Karen Launchbaugh, and I am going to talk to you about how you might um, anticipate the differences in nutritive value from uh, grasses, forbs, shrubs at different types of the, times of the season, and then also a little bit about how plants might become toxic. So this is important for range management, especially livestock management or wildlife habitat management. Okay, first of all, that general term forage quality, or when I talk about quality, I really do separate compounds into two attributes. First would be a set of compounds that give energy to the animal and create energy sources for growth and, and activity. Um, those could be divided then further into a couple of major um, categories. Energy could be provided by structural carbohydrates, cellulose, and other, and hemicellulose structural carbohydrates like that that can be fermented and turned into volatile fatty acids in the ruminant and create energy. The second group would be starches and sugars, which are those soluble carbohydrates. Uh, they are found largely in plant cell contents and they are digestible by all mammal systems, including ours and uh, also ruminants. The, the mammal part of their system can d digest these. There, there's no microbes required. Uh, the final group would be fats. Now, there's not much fat content in range forage. There's, of course, some in nuts like acorns, and there will be a bit in some of the seeds that we find. But they're not an important, they're, they're not an abundant source of energy, but they are an important source of energy for non-ruminant animals and small animals such as birds and rodents. So again, energy would be that first category, which would include carbohydrates and fats. The next category would be nutrients. So when I'm talking about nutrients in plants, uh, focus first on protein. Protein generally includes all nitrogen-containing compounds. Of course, proteins are amino acids, which are nitrogen-based compounds. Uh, but there's also non-protein nitrogens available. And as in the case of ruminants, those non-protein nitrogens uh, can, will turn into protein in the, in the rumen. Uh, they turn into microbial proteins. So protein or crude protein is just nitrogen-containing compounds. Minerals can also be very important. On rangelands, we generally focus on phosphorus. And that's because phosphorus is needed in large amounts by animals, especially reprodu reproducing animals. But it's available in limited amounts. So anything that is required in large amounts and available in small amounts would be limiting. And phosphorus is one that is often limiting on rangelands. Potassium can also be limiting. It's a macronutrient, a, a macro mineral that's required in fairly high comp, uh, amounts. Um, often it's more available in forages, so it's seldom limiting, but it can be. Calcium also can be a limiting factor. And selenium is an interesting uh, mineral that we're often worried about on range because in excess it can be toxic, and in if it's not in abundant sources, uh, in enough availability, then it can really um, hamper reproduction and growth. So selenium can either be too much or not enough, and so it's one that um, often comes up as a concern for producers. So again, when I talk about minerals, I'm going to focus mostly on phosphorus, but there are other minerals that might be important. Vitamins, the main vitamin of interest on rangelands, especially in young animals, is vitamin A or carotene. Uh, this can be limiting because vitamin A is abundant in green plants. But when you go into the dormant season or winter, green plants are not available. So carotene or vitamin A can be quite uh, limiting. And that's why we might have evergreen plants like juniper, which has very little forage value in general, but it, does, it is a source of carotene, so it can be really valuable with green plants in the winter. Other, animal, other uh, vitamins that uh, producers might uh, be concerned with might be vitamin E, vitamin D, and a few others. So it's really kind of case specific depending on the forages available. So um, for me, mostly protein, phosphorus, and carotene would be the compounds that I look at most when trying to determine the nutritive value of a plant on rangelands. Okay, thinking about the nutritive value of a plant, and if you just step back for a minute, and you try to think about what are the major attributes of a plant that influences nutritive value. I break it down to these three major factors. And throughout the rest of this presentation, I'll talk about how these three factors influence the overall forage value of a plant. 
The first is the cell structure, particularly the amount of cell wall to cell contents. Uh, so the more cell contents a plant has, the more nutrients it has, and the more cell wall has it has, the more structural carbohydrates it has. The second is lignification. Of course, lignin is something that is not digestible, so the more lignified something I a plant is, the less digestible and less valuable it is. And then finally, secondary compounds, or any factors that create anti-quality. So the first two attribute to quality and then secondary compounds create anti-quality, or things that take away from quality. So toxins, uh, other things like tannins, even lignin can be considered an anti-quality factor. So we'll talk about some of those. Okay, first, I said the, the first most important, most important factor is the cell structure, especially the relationship or the ratio between cell walls and cell contents. Okay, the reason that's so important is because in the cell contents, inside that cell wall are mostly soluble compounds. They're compounds that non-ruminants can digest. Uh, mammalian systems can handle these soluble compounds such as sugars or starch or fats or soluble proteins and organic acids. So all of those things um, can be digested without um, benefit of a large rumen or microbial relationship with ruminant uh, microbes. So we mammals can digest the cell contents. And even for ruminants, these cell contents are really digestible and really you know, kind of high energy and nutrient sources. If you think about it from the plant standpoint, the cell contents, or those cell solubles, are um, parts of the fabric of doing metabolism in the plant. A plant that's photosynthesizing has organic acids and such which serve as um, as mechanisms of photosynthesis. So lar largely plants that are alive and plants that are growing and photosynthesizing have these cell solubles inside them just for the regular metabolism and everyday life of the plant. So these are the things that the plant uses as currencies of energy and enzymes and, and just activity. Okay, outside the shell of that is the cell wall. Cell wall is made up of several fermentable or digestible components such as pectin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. Remember these are compounds that we non-ruminants have a difficult time digesting, um, but uh, ruminants and hindgut fermenters like horses and pigs to some degree and rodents, um, both those ruminants and non-ruminants um, have a, a relationship with microbes in their gut, and it's the microbes that actually break down that cellulose and hemicellulose and pectin. So um, they vary in digestibility. Usually to get a lot of energy out of especially cellulose and hemicellulose, you have to have a symbiotic relationship with a microorganism. So ruminants and hindgut fermenters like horses and rabbits can digest these things. We mammals can't. So the cell wall then is really something that we can't use much as energy. I say much because some, some components like pectins can have a little bit of digestibility. Uh, then there's another set of compounds in the cell wall that are truly used for structure and have almost no forage value at all. Lignin, cutin, and silica. They're indigestible fractions and so when they're in the cell wall they're something that cannot be digested or used as energy. So basically for us non-ruminants those cell solubles are important, so birds, small rodents, um, insects, a lot of animals that can't adjust cellulose rely on those cell solubles. Cell sol the cell wall becomes valuable to ruminants and hindgut fermenters. This uh, figure here is a figure from this uh, article by Lyons, which is a required reading for the class, so I'm just bringing it up here just to jog your memory. Again, we have those fermentable energy sources that are in the cell wall, the structural carbohydrates. If we send them to the lab, they, com they would come back as fractions of NDF, neutral detergent fiber, or ADF, acid detergent fiber. Inside the cell solubles, we, get, we have crude protein, uh, which would include nucleic acids, amino acids, proteins, non-protein, nitrogens, and other nitrogenous compounds and uh, sugars or starches or lipids would all be fractions of soluble energy. And then finally, those secondary compounds, which we'll talk about later, 
such as alkaloids, terpenes, tannins, etc., they are often and usually found in the cell solubles or the cell contents also. So when you read that chapter or that article by Lyons, this figure will come up and those authors will explain this a little bit more. Again, the big point here is that the amount of cell wall to cell contents ratio determines the forage value of a plant because the more cell solubles you have, the higher nutritive value the plant has. The more cell wall the plant has, the less nutritive value but higher um, digestible energy or fermentable energy. Let's talk a little bit about lignin. Okay, this messy diagram of a um, of a c compound, a, you know, a, a, um, a chemical diagram here, is not something that you have to learn for class. It's just an example of the kind of chem complex chemistry that lignin involves. They're very amorphous kinds of compounds um, that are basically carbon-based um, and have a lot of non-digestible carbon bonds. So. When you think of lignin, think of these really amorphous, ingestible, large, complex, carbon-based compounds. And to show you that they're non-digestible, this is a figure that I took from Jung and others and Vogel. And they just looked at the amount of lignin content, and this was in grasses, and they compared, they um, looked at how much it affected dry matter digestibility. And boy, you can see that as a lignin goes from, say, 2 to 10 percent, it's not a great deal of the dry matter, but as it um, as it increases from two to ten percent, the digestibility goes from eighty down to about thirty percent. So, small increases in lignin can have huge reductions in digestibility. The reason for that is that lignin itself is indigestible. But furthermore, that complex compound it wraps around cellulose and other digestible carbohydrates and makes them inaccessible to microbes. So it's kind of like taking dental floss and wrapping it around spaghetti or something. The spaghetti is digestible, but when you take a bunch of dental floss and wrap it around and threw out that dental floss, which represents lignin in this case, would make the spaghetti useless. And that's what lignin does to a lot of the cellulose compounds in cell walls. Now finally, let's just, that third point is those secondary compounds, also called anti-quality factors. Plants contain a lot of secondary compounds or toxins, and we're going to talk about those in the next lecture in this class. The ones that we most often hear about on rangelands would be alkaloids, terpenes, tannins, to some degree glycosides. Uh, nitrates can also be um, quite a problem under certain situations. And then soluble oxalates is something also that we'll see a lot of animals die from in certain situations. So everything from sagebrush to lupin and everything in between has a great deal of oxalates. On the class website, I'm going to post a, a video that talks about the huge variety of toxins that face animals that are out foraging on rangelands. And they really have to find ways to deal with these toxins because almost everything they eat has some secondary compound in it. The plants that we, ha that we eat, um, broccoli, cauliflower, onions, they also have secondary compounds in them, but over generations and generations and generations, our predecessors, our predecessors domesticated those plants, and largely what they were doing was breeding plants that didn't have secondary compounds in them. So we tend not to have so many secondary compounds, and when we go down to the grocery store, we can pretty much be assured that there's not going to be a lot of toxins in our food. On the other hand, ruminants and non-ruminants and animals foraging out on rangelands have to face these things every day, and the value of a plant is dependent on how much of these compounds are contained in the plant. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the different plant parts. They can vary dr immensely in the forage value. So let's think about the different plant parts. You would have like seeds, leaves, stems, and roots, and how much all of those might vary. And if you had to go foraging out on rangelands, it's pretty good to know which, uh, which, com which plant part has the highest forage value. And when you're watching animals eat, uh, you can pretty much see this. First of all, the most nutritious of all those plant parts are the fruits and seeds of the plant. Root crowns can also be really important uh, sources of starch and can be quite digestible. Flowers, uh, some flowers can have you know, pretty digestible components and all of those parts of the plant would be more digestible and more nutritious than the leaves or stems. So generally they have high cell contents or high cell solubles. Seeds can even contain a high amount of fat or relatively high amount of fat. 
So bottom line is these fruits and seeds and nuts that create the mast crop of a plant, I think if you saw back in the introduction to the plant parts, remember that term mast, which is a crop of seeds and fruits, the mast of a plant can be highly digestible because they have very thin cells and very large cell contents. Okay, now let's take a look at leaves versus stems. This graph again is from that reading by Lyons. And if you take at the left of that graph, leaves are you know four, three times more digestible than stems, the white and the gray bar. And then forbs is the same. They're three or so times, almost four times more digestible than the stems. And brows also the leaves are more digestible than stems. Okay, so why is that? Why are leaves more digestible than stems? First of all, think about what the role of a leaf is versus the role of a stem. Okay, leaves are meant for photosynthesizing, and remember I said parts of plants that are actively photosynthesizing have a lot of cell contents because that's what they're meant to do in life. On the other hand, stems are meant to hold leaves out so that they can photosynthesize, so they're structural. So leaves have more cell contents and less structural carbohydrates than stems. So that's why they're more digestible to the animal. As plants mature, they also become less digestible. So just in general, as plants get older, I mean, it's not a surprise, young plants are fairly nutritious, and as they get older, they become less nutritious. Let's think about why. So most range plants are highly nutritious when they're young. Even relatively undigestible plants, weeds such as cheatgrass, can be very nutritious when they're young. As they mature, they lose their nutritive value because they have increased structural carbohydrates, those cell walls tend to thicken. They also can become more lignified. Even though herbaceous plants are ones that don't have much lignin, even herbaceous plants can have a little bit of lignin, and so that lignin can start to accumulate, and certainly woody plants become quite lignified as they get older. And then another problem, as the plant grows older, it elevates its stem, especially I'm thinking about grasses and forbs here, they elevate their stem, and the amount of material that's, um, that is contributed by stem is greater than the leaf, so the stem to leaf ratio increases. So all of those reasons lead to plants that have more structural carbohydrates and less cell contents. So one other problem that happens as plants get older, um, their cell walls can become a little bit more leaky, and if it rains, those nutrients in the cell contents can wash away. So that's called leaching. Leaching is when the rain actually washes those soluble nutrients out of the plant onto the soil. And plants that are really resistant to leaching because of their structure or plants that are in dry climates are often said to cure well. Um, th this can be uh, important uh, in the plains, uh, in the hot northern plains like North Dakota where I came from or South Dakota. We, we tend to have really dry, cold falls. And so therefore, the grass tends to cure pretty well because it, there's not rain to wash those nutrients away. On the other hand, in the California annual grasslands, they tend to have the plants grow up and stand there and be fairly high. Even though they're dead, they'll be fairly high nutritive value until you start to have fall rains. And when you start to have fall rains, a lot of times a lot of those nutrients wash away and the forage value will be decreased. So in the Pacific climate where you have fall and winter rains, Leaching can be a serious problem. Talk a little bit more about shrubs, and this is going to relate some to that lignification issue. R remember that browse, browse is that portion of a shrub that is used as forage. It's generally the leaves and current season twigs. So when I talk about browse, that's what I'm talking about. And he, and why um, are browse? Why do browse lose forage value as they get older? So we commonly find that um, animals will eat the new leaves and twigs of shrubs, but as they get older, they lose nutritive value. So last year's growth will be less nutritious than this year's, and y you can just follow deer or wildlife around. And they're really good at finding that new year's growth because it's higher nutritive value. Well, I've already mentioned that the reason why that occurs is because of lignification. As stems grow old, they become more lignified. In this uh, figure here by Jung also, Jung and Allen in this case, talks a little bit about how lignification happens. The outside of a cell wall is called the primary cell wall. It's the really rigid 
part of a cell wall, and then inside is a secondary cell wall. And very in the very middle of a cell is that cell lumen, or that's where those cell contents are. And what this diagram shows is that, that as walls thicken, they thicken from the outside in. And as the plant grows older and older and older, the, the, the cell wall becomes thicker and thicker and pushes, actually eventually eliminates the cell contents. Just makes it smaller and smaller and smaller space until it's gone. So that's why when you uh, cut a young stem, you'll see sap and it will be kind of soft. But when you cut an old log, it will be just solid because that lignin has become more and more and more condensed towards the center of the cell. And then the, um, the digestibility of those compounds also are affected by lignin. So outside there's high lignin concentration, and inside there's less. So as plants grow old, the lignin starts to grow from the outside in and pushes out all the cell contents. So that's why this year's growth is more nutritious than last year's growth on woody plants. Now, still moving on this idea of comparative forage value now, this time of grasses, forbs, and shrubs, let's take a look throughout the season in the nutritive value. So again, nutritive value, I'm going to focus on protein, phosphorus, and carotene, or vitamin A, in range forages. This was a graph that was created in 1969, so it's been around a long time, and it's just kind of my rendition of it. But basically what it shows is, in the spring, um, when plants start to grow, they, when they become green and they start to have high enough amounts, they'll furnish a lot of these nutrients to animals. So forbs, grasses, and browse will all be highly nutritious. So green plants are nutritious. They're photosynthesizing, they're active, and they'll have nutrients in them. The most abundant form of nutrients is usually in forbs, and grasses are, are good, but they're usually not as high in protein, phosphorus, and carotene as forbs. So Think about a comparison maybe between alfalfa, that is known as really high nitrogen, high nutrient plant, and something like orchard grass, which is a fine grass. It's just not nearly as high in protein and nutrients as alfalfa. So that would be a four grass comparison. And browse can also be very high, but usually their cells are a little thicker and their nutrient value is a little bit lower. So forbs are the most nutritious. And why is that? Why are young why is young forb material more nutritious than grasses. Going back to our three reasons that affect nutritive value, there, one of those is really important, and that is the cell wall. So here I have just a couple of diagrams. Remember on the left, remember grass cells are those thick cells, those square cells. They have parallel veins. They're usually these square, th uh, thick cells. And you can see the cell wall in this diagram on the left it looks pretty thick. On the right-hand side is a forb cell. I think this was a bean plant. And it has kind of a, a thick cell a leaf uh, margin on the top there. But the cell walls below that are, tend to be pretty thin. Uh, so just looking at the size of those cell walls from grasses to forbs. So the actual cell contents is higher in forbs. So therefore, they have higher nutritive value. So again, going back to those first three compounds, if all you could measure in a plant was how much cell wall it had, it would tell you a lot about the nutritive value. So in summary again, during the growing season, forbs are more nutritious than grasses, but almost everything is, is fine during the growing season. Because cell walls, or cells are actively growing, they're nutritious. Um, because the cell walls of grasses are thicker, they tend to be a little bit less nutritious than forbs. And that can be really important when you're looking at, um, like for example, right now we're quite interested in sage grouse and what young chicks eat. And young chicks have very high forage requirements and they eat little forbs because forbs are the most nutritious thing out there in the spring. So forbs can be really important for animals like young sage grouse chicks. In the dormant season, browse, however, are more nutritious and they're an important source of nutrients, more nutritious than grasses and forbs. Think about that. Why is that? Why are browse such an important source of nutrients, especially protein, in the winter? Well, it's largely because what has happened to the grasses and forbs in the winter? They're herbaceous plants. They've died back to the ground. They do not have plants that are metabolizing. Shrubs and browse are active. They're alive. They're above the ground and they're alive. So anything that's metabolizing is going to have cell contents and it's going to have soluble compounds in it. So 
the main difference here is that the browses the browse plants are alive in the fall and winter so they provide good sources of protein and soluble carbohydrates grasses and forbs are di have died and they may be important for energy which we'll talk about next but they're not important nutrient sources in the winter I, I just am going to have to put one disclaimer here there's some relatively new research that is reaffirming something that um, that is pretty important and that is that for browse are really important nutrient sources even in the growing season so those diagrams I showed you by Parker they might have been a little bit off here is a diagram that has four wing saltbush winter fast winter fat prostate a prostrate kochia rubber rabbit brush and sagebrush and then that lo that bottom line with the lowest level of protein consistently from May to December is crested wheatgrass Okay, so even though crested wheatgrass is a fine grass and it's actually quite high during the growing season, 12 or 13 percent protein is, is just fine for animals that are, are growing and, and you know, living out on range. Still, it's way less than any of those shrubs and forbs. So look at those levels of protein in the shrubs ranging from 15 to 20 some percent. So what this research is showing that uh, maybe we misunderstood or, or didn't realize how important browse were. The other reason browses are, can be difficult to harvest and they can be difficult to digest, but they are good sources of nitrogen. And this data, these data were from near Malta, Idaho, so this should be relevant to most of our rangelands up here in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, switch gears. Let's talk about energy for a second. Again, remember, energy is going to be largely structural carbohydrates. Uh, Cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate on Earth. So when we talk about rangelands and, and energy, we're largely talking about cellulose. Yes, yes, there's some starches and sugars inside the cell. But most of the energy that animals harvest on rangelands is in the form of cellulose or structural carbohydrates. So in the spring, when plants are growing, whether it's a forb, a grass, or a browse, they're all going to have pretty good sources of energy. Uh, so again, green plants, they have cells that haven't thickened a great deal yet. They've not become lignified, so they're pretty good sources of energy. Uh, now take a look at that green dotted line. That's the grass. And notice that grass is just throughout the whole life. It's a pretty superior source of energy. Better than forbs and better than browse. And why is that? Even well into the winter. Well, that's because the stems and leaves of grasses are largely standing cellulose. Those cell walls that I showed you a few diagrams back, that those square cell walls are made of cellulose. Cellulose is a really important energy source and uh, they're not highly lignified. So those herbaceous grasses are not highly lignified good cellulose. And although uh, throughout the fall and winter those cell contents may be washed out of the plant, the plant will become inactive, the cell walls are still going to be there. So that standing matter, those old dead grasses, are actually pretty good energy for ruminants and for hindgut fermenters like horses and rabbits. Of course, non-ruminants don't get much out of them, but they are good sources of energy for ruminants and hindgut fermenters. So again, in summary then, in the growing season, grasses, forbs, and shrubs all provide good sources of energy. Really no need to supplement energy. In the dormant season, grasses uh, provide a really stable source of energy. So think about that uh, when you're out, when the, we get into the winter, if you're trying to avoid supplementing animals, here's a good source of energy. The only way to use that energy, though, is to feed protein to those rumen microbes, because the rumen microbes are going to need to function, and they're going to need sufficient protein. And what might be a good source of protein in the winter? Shrubs. So that's why shrubs and forbs and grasses, why those things are needed in a, in a mix on rangelands. Kind of one little side note here. In Idaho, up north here, we have mostly cool season grasses, or C3 grasses, the bottom part of this diagram. Um, in the tropics and also in, even in the lo lower areas of North America, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, the dominant grasses there are warm season grasses, and then when you get down into the, tr into the South America, Argentina, Brazil, those are all warm season grasses. The reason that's important from a nutrient standpoint is that top diagram, the warm season grass, just look at how much extra um, 
cell walls are there. Th those thickened cell walls that are that they're diagramming there are are the components that help that plant um, be avoid losing nitrogen or I'm sorry avoid losing water. So warm season grasses are more adapted to dry and hot climates, and they have really thick uh, leaf margins, leaf walls, and then inside of the leaf they have these vascular bundles and they have these um, uh, sclerenchyma cells that surround the vascular bundles. And those things are good energy sources, but they take up space in the leaf and they make it so that there's not as much cell content or soluble nutrients in the leaf. Look at the space on the bottom diagram of the cool season plant. Very few of those vascular bundles that are just rough cellulose and a lot of room for soluble carbohydrates. So there is a difference between those warm season grasses which are have less nutritive value and the cool season grasses which have higher nutritive value. And it, it might be worth thinking about how that might affect us as climates and get warmer and as we have longer, hotter, drier summers, we're probably going to see an influx of warm season grasses. In Idaho we only have a few that are abundant. We have um, we have some aristidas or threons and a few other grasses. Char largely we don't have any warm season grasses. Okay, so I've already kind of bridged that mark about what environmental influences might affect the nutritive value of plants. Um, certainly temperatures are important. High temperatures tend to decrease those water soluble carbohydrates and soluble proteins. So as, as temperatures get hotter throughout the season or in hot dry summers, we tend to see less soluble carbohydrates and proteins. Another thing that temperature tends to do is it tends to hasten lignification and maturation. And so the plant sort of uh, becomes dormant more quickly and of course loses that forage value. Um, uh, when you have years, I'm talking about moisture next, in years where you have moderate moisture stress versus severe moisture stress, this is kind of an interesting thing that happens. Um, Oftentimes, I used to hear ranchers talk about it was a drought year, and yet when they brought the cattle in, they they had a pretty good year. The cattle weighed pretty pretty well, and I never could figure out that why those grasses, when they were kind of really stressed out, why they were still nutritious, and that's because moderate moisture stress tends to increase the nutritive value of plants, and it can also delay maturation. So the plants may not be very thick; they might not have as much biomass. But the biomass that they have can be quite nutritious because the cell contents are sort of concentrated. So what happens in drought years, um, oftentimes cattle will grain will um, will do quite well because they um, they are eating these plants, and as long as there's enough biomass out there, the plants are pretty high quality. On the other hand, if you have a year where there's really severe moisture stress, really hot, dry summer, then then that has an opposite effect on plant. It hastens translocation of nutrients to the roots and it, it really speeds up senescence. So uh, the plant goes dormant and just really doesn't have the nutritive value. So the effect of moisture on quality of plants really varies depending on how bad the summer is or how bad the growing season is. Another uh, interesting aspect about nutritive quality of plants is that it varies from place to place. The, what range site a plant is growing on can influence how nutritious it is. Fertile sites can delay maturity and they can increase the leaf to stem ratio of plants so that those plants on those fertile like high nitrogen sites or high organic matter sites can really be more nutritious and last longer through the season. Uh, especially nitrogen is important. If you have soils that have high nitrogen that will increase the protein content of plants and you can measure that so the same plant say crushed wheatgrass from one place to another can vary in protein value just because of the range site. Um, we'll talk a lot about anti-quality factors in the next uh, in the next lecture but I want to just open the point here. Uh, most, first most important point is that anti-quality factors are most common in forbs and shrubs. They're usually not abundant in grasses and that's because forbs and shrubs defend themselves from herbivory with secondary compounds. So they have a lot of these agents that are designed to help them against herbivores, including insects and the environment that might affect them, versus grasses that use a strategy that is more of tolerance. So grasses have the ability to regrow after, after they're eaten, and they don't spend so much energy to, in time creating secondary compounds to protect them from herbivory.
So grasses and, and are tend to have low secondary compounds, usually not toxic, whereas most of the toxic plants out there are forbs and shrubs. Three different actions that these secondary compounds can have that will reduce forage quality. The first is that they might they themselves might just resist digestion. So some compounds are not digestible, like lignin, for example. Um, and, and if you have a lot of lignin, then that decreases the overall forage of value of the plant. Um, another aspect is that the secondary compounds might bind with other compounds in the plant and create a situation where they become indigestible. We already talked about binding of lignin with other compounds. Uh, and tannins are another one that bind with uh, protein compounds and make them indigestible. Another way that compounds can de inhibit digestion is they can actually kill the rumen microbes in the gut. And if you have a, the rumen of an animal, if it's not functioning at top rate and some of those microbes start to die off because of something that has been eaten, well then that reduces the whole digestibility of the whole system. This is the same with us if we have the stomach flu or something. It just we just really don't can't get nutritive value out of plants. Um, there are some compounds, terpenes mostly, that when animals eat a lot of these terpenes, they actually just kill the kill the microbes in the gut. So we'll talk about those later. And then finally, that last category, the one that gets most of the press, are the toxins. And toxins are the things that cause illness or death. And so when I say a toxic plant, I really mean something that causes some bad condition in the growth or metabolism of the animal. So alkaloids terpenes, tannins, um, oxalates, those kinds of things are toxins. So, recap, uh, just to bring all these points together, um, forbs are important sources as protein and vitamin A or carotene during the growing season. They're especially abundant. Forbs are important um, pretty much all year, but, I mean, sorry, shrubs are important all year, but really especially in the winter when they maintain phosphorus and protein levels. So they really become important winter forages. Uh, grasses are important sources of structural carbohydrates throughout the year. Remember, they're that standing cellulose that is really an important energy source for ruminants and hindgut fermenters. Forbs and shrubs can contain a lot of anti-quality agents that decrease their forage value, and grasses usually do not contain anti-quality anti agents. Here's a cool sum summary graph that I just found um, on a doc in a paper that was talking about the vegetation dynamics of Yellowstone, but I think this graph sort of puts it all together. Um, as you go from spring to fall, we know that plants become less nutritious, and that's because one thing, the leaf to stem ratio decreases, so the number of leaves and the amount of stems increases, leaves decrease. Percent of crude protein decreases, that's largely because the cell walls are getting thicker, the cell contents are getting smaller. The percent of DOM, or digestible organic matter, also decreases, again, because the cell walls are getting thicker, the cell contents are getting less or smaller, and then we start to have some lignification that is um, grabbing some of those structural carbohydrates and making them indigestible. So as you go throughout the season, the digestible organic matter in the plant goes down. The things that increase at that same uh, time, so th from spring to fall, increased neutral detergent fiber. Again, neutral detergent fiber is a measure of the cell wall. So what we're seeing as plants mature is that they get more cell wall, both because their stems have more cell walls and because their leaves uh, tend to thicken. The cell walls in their leaves tend to thicken. And then the other thing that happens as the season goes along is the plant quits growing. It becomes senescent. Uh, and remember, plants that are growing Plants that are actively metabolizing have soluble compounds in their, in their cells. So as plants die, they lose those sol soluble compounds and they become standing cellulose. So those are the main factors that are in increasing and decreasing throughout the year to reduce forage value of plants. The implications of that to animal nutrition um, are varied, but here's a few to take home. Monocultures can be really important to provide a big flush of nutrients, for example, either in the spring or in the fall, finding a plant that really uh, matures at a time when, when nutrients are needed, and planting a monoculture can be really important. So we talk about, so for example, planting uh, food plots in the spring when um, livestock have high demands for, uh, because they're calving or lambing, or when wildlife are around and we're doing, creating food plots. Monocultures can be very effective. 
but the flip side of that is that if you want to create a nutrient source throughout the whole year, you need a variety of range plants because they provide nutrients at different times of the year and they also provide a variety of nutrients. Okay, that's because plants mature at different times during the year. And remember, young plants are more nutritious, so if you have plants that are maturing at different times of the year, you'll ha they'll, reach their, they'll reach their peak nutrient value at different times of the year and then they'll spread out the nutrient value throughout the year. So the seasonal supply of nutrients will improve by having plants that, that um, mature at different times of the year and then also by having different classes of forage. We looked at differences between grasses, forbs, and, and browse. They all provide different levels of nutrients, so having a variety of those plants will provide a more stable source of nutrients for animals. Um, probably the most important thing is that browse, which provides the, those nutrients in the winter when they're really a limiting. If you want to increase use of range by wildlife, um, it is, is really important because um, that diversity is needed and not all animals eat the same thing. So uh, the more diverse the landscape of nutrients are out there, the more diverse landscape of wildlife and livestock you can have out on the range. So diversity of plants equals diversity of animals that it can support. Okay, that's a pretty broad overview of the forage value uh, of plants according to plant type, forbs versus shrubs versus grasses, and then also how that varies throughout the season. Um, just remember there's three main factors that determine the forage value of a plant, and that's that cell content to cell wall ratio. It's also if there's lignification involved, and then finally if there's secondary compounds that are influencing forage value. Um, so that should help you uh, to determine forage value of plants.